All right. So I want to talk about what are our options and alternatives when you're in it and you realize it's not going well. What do you do? Like, what are your options to make things better? There's many different options. So let's say you have plan A. Wait, you want to pivot to plan B. Then you decide plan B doesn't work. Then you make plan C, plan D. There's so many different options. Specifics to that would be you could exclusively pump and bottle feed. You could do some direct breastfeeding and you could bottle feed breast milk or donor breast milk or formula. You could combo feed where you're doing a combination of direct breast feeds with breast milk or formula. Like there's just so many different options. Why are you laughing? <laughs> because Luke was giving you the evil eye. <laughs> From the moment that life-changing stick revealed its verdict, our journey began. Suddenly, we were entrusted with the monumental task of motherhood. But amidst the joy, fear of the unknown sets in. How do we navigate this uncharted territory? With countless voices ready to guide us, it's easy to feel lost. Hey, I'm Hillary. I'm the founder of Baby Seller. I'm also a registered nurse and mom of four. I hope to be your trusted friend who helps guide you through the maze of early motherhood. I'm grounded in medical expertise with a sprinkle of crunchiness, and I'm here to debunk myths and unravel truths. With a dash of type A energy, I promise to leave no stone unturned. Joining me on this adventure is my non-medical older sister, a future mom herself. Together, we'll get into the heart of early motherhood, asking the tough questions and seeking honest answers. So grab a cup of coffee, steal a moment for yourself, and let's dive into the adventure of early momming together. All right. Welcome back, mamas. We have an excellent show and conversation to have today. I'm Hillary, your host. I'm also the founder and CEO of Baby Settler, and I'm a mom of four. And I'm Erica, Hillary's big sister, a future mom, and our listeners, non-medical type A ambassador each week. I am really excited to talk today about um, the nuances of breastfeeding and combo feeding. I didn't even know what that was in our first episode, so I'm really excited to dig into that. Um, but first... I want to dilly dally with you a little bit. Um, we are together at Baby Settlers headquarters, Charleston, in person. South Carolina. Yeah, Charleston, yes. South Carolina. Um, I am in and out real fast um, in Charleston. Um, I have had Hillary with me. You've been with me for like three weeks now, huh? Yeah, it's been great. It has been great. I have enjoyed. Why are you time having a deep breath? Like um, that? Oh my gosh. The last couple weeks have been a whirlwind. <laughs> <laughs> I got stuck in Arizona. So I flew with my three youngest out to Scottsdale to drop two of mine off with Erica and then tropical storm Debbie decided to head towards Charleston and I couldn't get back home for like three days. I loved it because I, I got to keep too. you. I loved it too. I just don't love parenting solo. Um, and Luke was home with our 12 year old who he definitely got the, the easier. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't think so. Yeah. But he did. Well, I would like to think that I was a good, maybe you were. sometimes you were. parent. You were. Um, we were describing last night, we were telling Luke a little bit about, um, how it was with Nate, my husband reacting to having all the kids around. Cause he's not used to having all these kids around for extended periods of time. And so I said, he did great. Um, we were at a restaurant one night and, Chelsea's kitchen, Chelsea's kitchen in, in Phoenix, my favorite, absolute favorite place to eat in Phoenix. Every time I go there, I have to go there. It's yeah. It's so awesome. Um, so it's like always a stop, but we had, I don't think we've ever taken all three of your, no. All, and there's always a wait. you can't make reservations. Yeah. So you're pretty much always waiting at least 30 to 45 minutes. Yep. So we waited, um, with three of the kids, the three youngest kids and got in there and Hillary and I were just, you know, grabbing kids and feeding them and pulling them off of the back table time. <laughs> you know, it was, we got sat in a booth that had, they had their like water station, water station and silverware station right there. So I'm not even paying attention. And Erica's like, Ooh. Clay's like reaching for the water pitcher to pull <laughs> down, awesome. but they were good, but it they was were great. But that was probably the epitome of Nate just being like, Oh my God. <laughs> so he decided crazy. that what he's got two max. Yeah. So we have 
obviously gone along this journey. We're hoping to have kids and we don't know how many kids I'm like, I've always, I've always been like, okay, we'll try, we're going to do one and we're going to see how it goes. Um, but he, we got in the bed one night and he was like, Okay, so I'm pretty firm on not more than two children. He wants to do the man all man defense. Yeah, yeah the he man doesn't man want to have to do his own defense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so that was really fun. Yeah. Um, so I'm just tired. It's been yeah. school went back this week. The kids are back in school. It's just been a lot of a lot of stuff. It's been a busy couple of weeks. Yeah, it has. Yeah, and I'm East Coast, and then dropping the kids off, and then going to a work trip. So I feel like I'm not going to, sl- I haven't slept and won't for weeks. So, um, but it's been really good. Yeah, I've loved fun. being around and you. I love that we are getting to record a podcast together. Yeah. It's nice. Um, but the kids are back in school now. Yeah. They started they school this week. Yep. The day after, I think we got back at like 6 PM and they started school the next day. They did. So Ruth and Ben went to bed at like 8 45 that night, which would have been 5 45 mountain time. Yeah. But then the next morning they felt like they were waking up at 3 30 AM. So it was a little rough. Yeah. How'd they do? They did good. They did good. Clay did not do well with them going back to school. He does not like being left behind. Oh, he wants to leave in the morning. He's cried the last two mornings when they have walked out of the house. Oh no. So, That's so yeah. sad. But then he's fine, but it is, it's funny to, they, he's had them home all summer. Yes, he yeah. has. And he's really enjoyed that. And he's been, he's been asleep sometime. Like he'll wake up right as they're walking out of the door. So mm-hmm. he doesn't really get to see them so in the morning. Rude that they're just like, rude. okay, bye. So rude. Hey, yes. bye. Yeah. Um, well, in addition to you being there, you then left. We had hurricane Harbor with your time, <laughs> the extension of your time in Phoenix. We let the hurricane pass. Um, you came home and then I had Ben and Ruth in Arizona for the rest of the week. Um, and that was really fun. We did lots of things. Um, I took them to a crock walk. There's like a a herpetological sanctuary in Phoenix and, um, Hillary hates alligators, nightmares of alligator. It's like, I have a true phobia. I mean, I've so many times thought to myself, I need to go find a therapist and get exposure therapy or something like <laughs> to alligators. I don't know. I mean, yeah, that wouldn't be safe. No. So I don't know how they would like images of alligator, but literally every time I see alligators and we live in South Carolina, so there are lots of alligators. I always tell Luke, if we didn't live here, I feel like my anxiety would be reduced by 50% because so many things you about worry about the creatures. Yeah. Like early momming in Charleston, South Carolina and in the Southeast, it's like where there's water, alligator, there's pool. water everywhere, open yeah. water, alligators, and there literally can be alligators in any water around here. And I don't know. I can't remember. I think Boyd, my oldest was like a toddler when that terrible accident happened at Disney world. Oh yeah. Um, probably don't want to talk about that. No, but that is when it really, I was already scared of alligators, but that's when it like was early. It was a reality for somebody and and toddlers and young kids. So I'm just next level scared of alligators. Well, there were no alligators in Arizona. So, well, there were at the Phoenix well, herpetological the, yes, which I did not go. You guys <laughs> which, went to that. After when Hillary left. left, I was like, let's do all the things your mom doesn't want to do. <laughs> yeah. And so we took them. And so Ruth and Ben got to go on a croc walk, which was basically walking through this sanctuary with all the creepy crawlies and snakes yeah. and anacondas and no, thanks. giant alligators. So I think that was their highlight of the trip. I'm pretty yeah. sure. Um, well, they certainly wanted to show pool. me a lot of pictures of the alligators. Yeah, they want to freak you out. Crocodiles. They're like, we can't wait to show mom, send it to her. Now I'm like, it's like 9 PM where your mom is. I know <laughs> she's in bed. So yes, I was. yeah. And tonight, because we're in the same time zone. Yeah. Well, we're still kind of yeah. recording late because we yeah. have to wait for the kids to go to bed. Yeah, It's almost eight o'clock. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about what we're going to talk about today? So we are going to talk about the many nuances to feeding. So that incorporates breastfeeding, combo feeding, formula feeding, just feeding in that first year of life and all of the different options, but then complications, challenges, and just tips on how to overcome things. And then also really be able to make an an informed decision about what will work best for you and your baby. Okay, great. Well, I have a lot of questions. I'm excited. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. So no. I'm very excited. I'm going to try to be brief. Okay. We know I won't be. No, you but won't. I will try. But that's okay. We what like, time is it? How like long? Every th- all right. Let's see say. how long this episode yeah, is. Yeah, it's okay. 
Um, I have been told by our sister that she wants a minimum hour and a half. So Courtney, what? Courtney says she wants a minimum hour and a half episode on every podcast for every podcast. Oh my she gosh. Like, I right. said, Courtney, Listen. these are early moms. They do not have time. Yes, these ladies please, have things you to have do. to let us know if you want long episodes. Cause I don't, in my mind, I'm thinking like 30, 45 minutes, but an hour and a half. She swears that she will pause and walk away and come back. You know what's funny? I listen to the Huberman podcast. It's like my favorite. It's science. It's like a science-based podcast, but he's mm, great. And I'm fun. Cur- it's fun. <laughs> I'm currently listening to an episode that is four and a half hours long. See? Yeah. So I listened to an hour of it this morning. I pause it and I'll come back to it. Yeah. It's just great. It's like yeah. just a book that never, a good book that never yeah. ends. Yeah. Well, all right. Okay. So uh, maybe I don't have to just be throw the clock out the window. Yeah. Hillary. Okay. All we're right. living, we're going wild tonight. All right. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So talking about, um, breastfeeding. Yeah. Tell me what does successful breastfeeding mean? Like to you as an expert, I see that a lot. Like you were successfully able to breastfeed or you are successfully breastfeeding. What does that mean as an expert? Like what classifies it successful? I think if you had to look at recommendations from the CDC or the World Health Organization, they would probably classify it as your baby having had exclusive breast milk in the first six months of their of their life. Um, There are benefits to that, which we can go into later. But me personally, as an expert who works with moms every day and is in real life, breastfeeding successfully means that it is some kind of breastfeeding, whether it's direct breastfeeding or whether it's bottle feeding pumped milk, maybe you're using some formula, maybe you're using some donor milk, whatever, but your baby is getting breast milk from directly from the breast or from the bottle. And it's mutually beneficial to both you and your baby. Okay. So I think successfully breastfeeding is going to be highly dependent on so many factors And I don't really even think it's my place as an expert, as a lactation consultant, as a healthcare professional to even try to make a goal of what successful breastfeeding would be for anyone else. Like it's highly personal and individualized based on your personal goals and your baby. And that might change because I think you probably as a mom going into wanting to breastfeed, you think oh, this is going to be a piece of cake, which I think I've learned. Actually, you'll, you'll be really proud of me. So I looked up a medical, oh, um, some medical information. Yeah. Where'd you, what was um, your source? Uh, you tell me later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, P- BMC public health. Okay. Um, I've got is the, that the British I'll medical. Y- yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'll give, I'll send you the link. Okay. Okay. And, and this is not medical advice and I am not an expert. Yes. yes, medical. This is just but a I'm study trying, that you found. Yeah, yes. study okay. that I found, and I'm trying to impress you. You, I, I'm impressed. Thank you. Um, so basically, they analyzed. They went back and analyzed like 59 papers, um, medical papers that were centered around whether moms were thinking were going into breastfeeding, thinking that it was going to be easy or hard, mm-hmm. and it was overwhelming that the mothers tended to think that breastfeeding was going to be easy when in actuality they tend, it tended to be a lot more challenging. So basically the, the study showed the the review of these papers showed that pretty much everybody thinks that breastfeeding is going to be easy. And then in reality, it's not. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think to kind of echo that when, you know, you may have certain goals for yourself and your goal may be, I'm going to give my baby colostrum for the first couple of days of life. And then I'm going to exclusively formula feed. Mm -hmm. And you could say breastfeeding was successful for you if that was your goal and you met that goal. Right. You know, but maybe you go into it and you think, oh, it is going to be easy. And And that is success. And your goal has changed because you realize a weekend, okay, I'm not cut out for this or I I can't do this or I can't physically like whatever, whatever the challenges are. I will be happy and this will be a success if yes. Yeah. And I think we can elaborate that on kind of my breastfeeding journey with my fourth baby. If you had asked me in the first six weeks, if I was successfully breastfeeding, I would say no. Mm -hmm. Um, I have, I'll share more about that, but looking back, 
I would say yes. You did. I successfully breastfed, and that was the most hard fought breastfeeding journey of all of my kids. And I'm so proud of us. Um, but it was somebody else might look at that and say, oh, she, and I just disclaimer, they have, I've been torn apart on social media Mm -hmm. for sharing openly about my use of formula with my fourth baby. And there would be other people in the community, lactation community that might say she didn't successfully breastfeed. She gave her baby formula, Mm -hmm. but I just, I don't think that that is, it's more of a personally defined success. Yeah. yeah, That's what I would say. Okay. Sure. That's great. So you mentioned, um, your last baby and clay and how that experience was maybe, from the outside, not defined as a successful breastfeeding journey. Um, maybe you can tell us just a little bit more about how that was. And now looking back, you think it was successful. So how did it go yeah. from being such a hard thing to, you know, it's the, a success it, I'm the most day. proud of myself for that breastfeeding experience out of all four of my kids. But so clay was, I, I, let me give a little bit of context. When we I, all saw, right? You all saw the it. birth yes. on Instagram. Yes, you guys all saw the birth at Baby Settler. <laughs> Everybody went, went to Instagram. Go back to July twenty twenty. Just going to pretend, yeah. Two. Um, with Clay, in my mind, I thought it was going to be the absolute easiest thing ever because I was a fourth time mom. Fourth time mom. A IBCLC or lactation consultant. I had done it many times before. I you help moms. I as help a moms like my, yeah, my, I, I own my own private practice. I help hundreds and hundreds of mom every you year. You know, all the secrets. I know all the secrets. All the tricks. I know everything. Like, I don't know everything. I'm not saying I know everything. <laughs> I thought I knew everything. There were things that I definitely learned and I'm still learning. But in my mind, I was like, this is going to be the absolute easiest breastfeeding journey ever. I'm going to have a great milk supply. I was not worried at all about feeding after birth. My other babies have all had feeding challenges and I just knew that this one was going to be so easy and I just wasn't worried about it. So fast forward to delivery last episode or a couple episodes ago, we talked about birth story. So if you're interested in more details around this birth, you can go back and listen to it, but it was kind of a traumatic birth. He has a, he had a shoulder dystocia it was a long birth. Um, he came out and immediately when I put him on my chest, I realized that he had an anterior tongue tie, which essentially means that his, there's different stages and, um, sorry, not stages, but there's different degrees of tongue tie. So tongue tie doesn't always mean you're going to have feeding difficulties. It doesn't always mean that you have to have the tongue tie released, but it can mean that there are going to be feeding difficulties and you have to look at the function of feeding. In the future, we will do a podcast on tongue ties because that's another favorite topic. And I think a lot of moms have questions about that. But here I'll just say. And you can't self-diagnose a tongue tie. Like like me, I couldn't. You could see it. You could see a tongue tie. But but I wouldn't be able to say, oh, this is going to cause problems. Right. It's it's all about function. Yeah. It's all about function. You have to have a function. So who do you go to to diagnose that? A very experienced lactation consultant. Someone, not just someone, just because somebody's a lactation consultant or a lactation counselor that does not mean that they are equipped or have the experience to really help you navigate that. So you want to go to somebody who is very experienced. And if you sense any red flags or if they can't clearly articulate what is going on or why they have a certain care plan for you, you need to run the other way and find somebody else because there are so many people that want to help moms and babies that they might lead you to believe that they really know what they're doing. And in, in reality, they don't. So that's, that's topic for another day, but he had a tongue tie that affected feeding. He, he really couldn't even take a bottle. Like in the first four, three to four weeks, he just was not a functional feeder. Um, giving him a, him a bottle, you had to do that with a certain technique. I'm very thankful that I am a feeding specialist and that I was able to figure it out. My husband, you know, this was his fourth baby. So he was used to giving bottles and just with a little bit of tips on how to help clay, we were able to get him to gain weight, but he didn't even really gain weight in the first two to three weeks. And that was bottle feeding him. So that just tells you how difficult it was to feed him. All of that made me very stressed. He wasn't latching. He wasn't removing milk from my breast. My body did not respond well to the pump. It's all about supply and demand. So if you're 
pumping and the milk is not coming out, either if your baby's not removing the milk or the pump is not removing the milk, then you're not putting in that demand for milk. And that is really hard in the first, in those first two weeks, like that is the initiation phase of breast milk production. Weeks two to four is the building phase. And if you're, you're not putting in that demand and the milk is not being removed, then it can really set you up to have supply issues down the road. Um, and he was not transferring well at the breast, my body. I tried when I tell you, I tried so many different pumps. I literally tried like 10 different pumps. Like I knew all the tricks. I knew the flange sizes were right. I did everything. I thought I had retained placental fragments, which I possibly did. I went back to my OB and got them essentially just imagine this. You're two weeks postpartum and uh, yeah, I already you know go to your OB going. and they do a pelvic exam and she like scraped out the inside of my uterus to make sure if this there, I wasn't asleep. Like it didn't hurt. I mean, honestly, it didn't really hurt that bad, but she scraped it out because I was like, I've got to have retained placental fragments. Like that's got to be why my breast milk is not coming in. And, um, inconclusive as to what, it, whether or not that was based on the pathology report that we got back. But I will say that I did notice my milk did increase after Mm. She did that, um, had my prolactin levels checked to make sure I my mean, prolactin levels I wouldn't have higher. even ever thought of yeah, that. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, I knew everything yeah. that you need to do, right? Yeah. And I still couldn't, it was still a lot out of my control because of just the stress and, yeah. So, mm-hmm. it was, it was, it was very stressful. Um, we ended up going on to do some direct breastfeeding. I think by five to six weeks postpartum, I was exclusively pumping. And then around six to seven weeks, I reintroduced some direct breastfeeds and we did combo feeding until he was about 10 months old. I would do one or two direct breastfeeds a day. He would get bottles of breast milk or formula throughout the rest of the day. And then around 10 months, I was like, I am just done. Like I hate pumping he's not really wanting to breastfeed anymore. And so we weaned, but that was like, I am so proud of myself for doing that because at five to six weeks postpartum, I did not think that we were ever going to, I feel like time. you're getting a little tear in your eye. Yeah, it was, it was hard. It was Is hard. it, are you like tearing up because it was hard or tearing up because you're proud that you persevered? I think both. I was just thinking we're sitting in my home office and I just saw my husband like walk past the window <laughs> and I had this thought, I remember, and I've asked him about this and he told me that he told me this because he knew it would encourage me and not hurt me. But I remember that I was couple weeks postpartum. And he said something to me like, you know, I, maybe it's just not going to happen this time. Like maybe you should just throw in the towel and it's just not going to happen. And you know, you can just do formula. And of course that was not what I wanted to hear. Um, and he, you know, we've had conversations about like, like my husband historically has always been the one where I'm ready when I'm ready to quit breastfeeding or when I'm having feeding challenges, he's like, don't quit today don't make an emotional decision. Like just keep what you keep doing what you're doing today. And then if you still feel the same way tomorrow, then that's when you can, you know, pivot or make another yeah, plan think about it more. Logically. Yeah. So he's yeah. very, so I, you know, in hindsight, I know that he said that to me because he wanted me to, he, you know, feel somebody, free to make the decision. Yes, if yeah. he, well, and also when somebody tells me I'm not going to do something <laughs> or so he's like, I like have to prove a point. Like, yes, I am going to make this happen. Like you just said, I can't do it. I am going to do it. So I, so, I think that's honestly was, like, that was what was behind it. Cause we've had conversations about that yeah. since then. So I know it was really emotional for you. Um, Oh yeah. With in, in during that period of time. And I sat, you know, as a support to you, hearing you, you know, and, and me as somebody who doesn't know any of this stuff, I'm also like, she's like, she's the baby settler. Like, <laughs> how, how, this must be really bad. I, I was never like, how could she not figure this out? I, I was just like, you must be a really bad eater or something like, yeah, it, it's definitely him. It's not her. Yeah. Um, um, but let's talk a little bit about, you know, when, when moms hit these challenges in breastfeeding, um, like, how does this, how do you find this makes, I know it made you feel defeated because you are this expert, like, but when you have moms that come in and see you, you know, in your, in your private practice, 
Um, what are some of the emotions? Like, I want to talk about normalizing the feelings that, that people might feel when they're going through these challenges. Yeah, I think it's multi-layered. I know for me, I felt like a failure and like a fake. Like, how can I not get this right? An when, imposter. Yeah, imposter. You had imposter, imposter syndrome. syndrome. Yes. So I had one of my good friends speak some truth into me. And she was like, you know what, Hillary? You need to treat yourself like you would treat any of the moms that you work with. And she was so right. And as soon as I did that, things got better for me. I also used my team to help speak truth and troubleshoot and kind of give me guidance because when you're in it, even when you are an expert, you, you know, you you have the mom hat on, but I would say as far as how other moms feel, I've actually thought about this a lot because there's so many moms that don't actually seek out support and advice from lactation consultants. And I think that there is this kind of innate feeling that this is my baby. Like I should be able to do this without Mm -hmm. anyone else helping me, Mm -hmm. or I should be able to figure this out. I'm their mom. And so I think it's a little bit vulnerable Mm -hmm. to reach out and ask for help. And also it might make you feel like a failure or if you, you know, you're type a, or you're, you know, like to be in control or you like to get things right all the time, or you Mm -hmm. like things to be perfect when you have to admit that something is out of your control, you're not sure how to fix it, or it just, it can make you feel it's a really vulnerable space Mm -hmm. to be. And that's what I've seen. And I think that you have to, as just a human, especially as a first time mom, you have to remind yourself that you have never done this before. Right. And I have to remind that because I am the, like the perfectionist and I want to do everything, you know, right the first time. And I want to be, you know, that type A person that just gets it right. But it is for, for first time moms, it is the first time you've ever breastfed a human and kept them alive. It's Mm -hmm. the first time you've ever cared for a child that depends on you. And sometimes I'm sure it comes really naturally to people and everything lines up and the stars align, but sometimes it's not that way. And I think that we have to give each other or we have to show ourselves grace because you have not done this before. And even when you have done it before, Well, that's exactly right. Like even when you are an expert and even when you have done this many times before, there's still, there's things that you haven't come up against before. Yeah. And it's your first time feeding this baby under those circumstances. Yeah. It's it's all, it, you know, every single time it's different. So I just think there's a lot of pressure on moms to feel like we have to get it right or we have to figure it out on our own. And that's just a lie that I don't know if it's society that tells us that, or if it's just our, I think some of it is just our in innate perception, honestly. Like, I think there is society telling us like, you need to do this, you need to do that. You need to be perfect. All these kind of things. But I think some of it is pressure that we put on ourselves, at least for me. Like, well, and then pressure from social media. Oh, social media for sure. Because I can only imagine the content that gets well, put out there. Comparison. Comparison yeah. is the thief of joy. Yeah. Like comparison, comparing what you're doing, what your journey looks like, what when well, everybody babies- wants the highlight. I mean, not everybody. Some people are very real, but most people on social media want the highlight reel out there. Yeah. So what you are seeing of your friend or even an influencer or somebody on social media, they're having this grand time with their brand new baby number one, maybe they are number two, they're not going to put the hard stuff on. Well, and here's a, like not to call out any of my local friends, but I have a personal Instagram account. I mean, not, I'm not going to call them out (laughs) specifically, but I have a personal Instagram account and I follow some of them and they're, you know, I'm 36 years old. Like we're all in the age of having babies. A lot of them are on their second or third baby, but they did. I know what's going on behind the scenes. Like their Instagram accounts look like life is bliss. Meanwhile, Mm -hmm. I'm seeing them in real life Mm -hmm. at our private practice. And I would, they're, they're validated. Yeah. 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 But like, and I'm not calling, if you guys are listening, I'm not calling you out for this. I'm just saying that 
that is true. A true yeah. statement. Like you would never know the challenges that they're going through yeah. based on what they're putting on Instagram. Yeah, that's totally true. All right. Well, let's get some conversation going on, you know, specifically why breastfeeding can be really hard. What are some of the most common challenges? I know you discussed your challenges and what made it very hard for you and Clay. What in your practice that you've seen as, you know, this expert, what are the most common challenges that moms face and are they fixable? Yeah. So I think starting with risk factors. So when I am doing a prenatal console or teaching a prenatal class, like I always like to go over, here are risk factors that could cause complications when you're breastfeeding with milk supply. So let's just start there. So history of hypothyroid, PCOS, anemia, breast surgery, breast biopsy, um, those get my attention for not saying that you're definitely going to have any kind of milk supply issue, but you are the patient that I definitely want to see within three to four days postpartum. Mm -hmm. Like I want to see you within three to four days postpartum so that if anything comes up, if your milk is not coming in, like expected, if your baby has a high percentage loss of birth weight, whatever we can get in there early Mm -hmm. and intervene and really implement a feeding care plan. That's going to support your goals. Other things that cause delayed milk coming in or can cause issues. And, and I'm, giving these off the top of my head. So I'm sure I'm going to miss some. So please don't rip me apart if I leave some (laughs) out, if you're listening and you're a lactation professional, but birth trauma. So long induction of labor, if you are induced and you have like a prolonged induction and you are on Pitocin and you've got a lot of fluid volume on board, that actually can affect your milk. And when it comes in, If you end up with an emergency C-section and that is traumatic and your body goes through a lot of stress, like that can, that can possibly cause a delay in milk. If you have a postpartum hemorrhage, a large loss of blood at birth, your body is probably going to prioritize other things as opposed to making milk right away. We see that. I don't know that there's any direct evidence that tells us that, but I will tell you like who in the world is going to run studies on that. So Mm -hmm. just because there's not a study that backs that up, I'm telling you in clinical practice from what I have seen, it is correlated Mm -hmm. like traumatic birth, postpartum hemorrhage after birth, um, magnesium. If you're have preeclampsia or you, you get put on magnesium during labor, we see that can delay milk coming in. Um, I'm trying to think of what else off the top of my head. There's just, there's your, if your baby's not latching right after birth. So I talked about it a little bit with clay. It's all about supply and demand. So if there's any complications at birth that would delay latching, or if you have a really sleepy baby because they're small for gestational age or they're preterm or whatever, we want to make sure that we're doing hand expression. We're doing some pumping and you're really working with a lactation. Yeah. Consultant. And you mentioned the different phases of milk supply. So yeah. when you're, getting ready to breastfeed, you should really be familiar with, okay, days, whatever to whatever, this is the initiation phase. Oh, I would love that. If, if all of my patients knew that information, they don't really. Yeah. I mean, but you write it down in your baby settler book. I did. Babies made simple. Babies made simple. It's in there. If you go read it, but I don't, they don't, I don't think they remember that. Yeah. There's a lot to remember, but that's very strategic. If you want to successfully breastfeed, yeah. Study the book. Yeah. Study. It's all in there, but your lactation consultant's going to tell you that. Yeah, they will. They will. They'll, they'll explain that to you. There's just, there's a lot. I think the knowing all of these things and having, hearing them multiple times will help you be able to to like absorb the information and understand it for sure. Okay. I have two questions. Okay. Um, fact or fiction. Oh gosh. Okay. Women with breast implants cannot breastfeed. Fiction, but nuanced. Okay. Do you want me to elaborate? Uh, Maybe just a little bit. So asking for nobody (laughs) in particular. (laughs) It depends. I have seen women with a history of breast surgery. What I mean, it doesn't even have to be implants. It could be a biopsy in your breasts, Mm -hmm. like history of a knife going through your breast breast tissue. Yeah. It can sever ducts. And it can cause concern for low, low milk supply. I also, again, no direct evidence on this, but I have a theory that if you have inflammation in your breast, so even like fibrous breast tissue or, 
um, let's say you have scar tissue in your breast, that it makes it more difficult for milk. Like babies are not necessarily strong enough to pull milk out. Mm. And so that over time will affect supply again, all about supply and demand. So if okay. it's not, so for a mom that I'm working with that I know she has a history of breast surgery, I have a very specific plan for her in the first two weeks postpartum. Okay, great. So if you're listening to this and you have that, you we offer virtual consults at Baby Settler. We also have a private practice in Charleston, South Carolina. We would love to work with you, but I would highly, wherever you are, would highly recommend scheduling a prenatal consult with a lactation consultant so that you can go into it knowing what your options are, knowing what to kind of look for and where the red flags might be. Yeah. And sure, you can, you can be a sponge and gain all this information, you know, free on social media, listening to podcasts and stuff, but there is so much value to having your person, your lactation consultant that knows you specifically knows what's going on and you having that person that can make a plan for you and really help you figure it out. Because when you're postpartum, you don't, you don't want to have to think like, you can't think like you that. You just want somebody sleep, to tell you. You want somebody to tell you, you want to understand why you're doing certain things, but you don't want to have to triage your situation. You don't want to have to come up with your own feeding plan of care. Like you want to rely on somebody and I think you will be more successful if you find that person before, before. you deliver. Yeah. And for sure. Of having to work through that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that kind of led me to question number two, which was, do some moms just really not have enough milk supply or is it back to that fibrous breast tissue issue? Again, there's really not good studies on this. There really isn't. I will say that by not good studies, there's not... I mean, you can find a study, honestly, like these days you can find a study to support any narrative. Like mm -hmm. it's, it can be really frustrating, but quality studies, I have not seen one that really gives us a definitive answer on this. I would say that there are women that have insufficient glandular tissue. Mm. So are those the women that are getting breast implants? Maybe. So maybe that's a correlation. Why are you looking at me like that? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I'm talking to you. I felt like you were judging me. I wasn't judging you at all. <laughs> I'm just saying like, you know, whatever. That's another thing. When I'm working with a mom who's told me that she's had breast implants, I'm like, oh, I wonder, did she have insufficient glandular tissue? And that's why she is having breast. That That is one for sure. If you have insufficient glandular tissue, then you will, you may have low milk supply and you may have a prop, like you may not be able to fully produce enough to cover the full volume that your baby needs. Got it. All right. So I want to talk about what are our options and alternatives when you're in it and you realize it's not going well, what do you do? Like, what are your options to make things better? There's many different options. So Let's say you have plan A, we, you want to pivot to plan B, then you decide plan B doesn't work, then you make plan C, plan D. There's so many different options. Specifics to that would be you could exclusively pump and bottle feed. You could do some direct breastfeeding and you could bottle feed breast milk or donor breast milk or formula. You could combo feed where you're doing a combination of direct breastfeeds with breast milk or formula. Like there's just so many different options. Why are you laughing? <laughs> because Luke was giving you the evil eye oh <laughs> through the window. <laughs> Context guys. If there is a plague in Charleston right now. I'm not even exaggerating. I backed out of my driveway today, the backup camera, there was a swarm. Just imagine like the whole backup camera being <laughs> swarmed by bird sized mosquitoes. Okay. And so I canceled all of our bug stuff like two years ago. Like we don't spray in our house anymore. We don't spray our There's yard. There's the crunch. Yes. But what has happened is that now we have a plague. So, well, Luke, I don't think it's just your house. It's in no. Charleston. There has been a hurricane. I think probably the moisture has made a lot more mosquito eggs and now yes. they have all hatched. But it's like so bad that I called Charleston County today and submitted a formal request for a flyover to drop <laughs> chemicals to kill all. So of we're okay. We're, we're, we're not doing the pest we, control. I make, Luke is making homemade laundry detergent with essential oils and Castile soap. 
But at the same time... So forget Terminix, but please dump pesticides on us from the air. Yes, so that the mosquitoes do not get us, okay? So here's the context of why I was just laughing and we interrupted this very important conversation. Because a couple minutes ago, we started hearing this, like, fogger, weed whacker, like lawn lawnmower type noise and it was very loud and we had to stop recording for 10 minutes we for had to 10 sit minutes. here and just look at each other even though everybody in this house knows that we're recording right now so luke took a fogger and was fogging per hillary's request was fogging her property with pesticides so that the mosquitoes would go away i did not request him <laughs> to do it during the recording of this podcast so the reason i'm laughing is because after eight minutes of us just waiting hillary decided to send a text message and i don't know what the text said but it just said we had to pause our recording fyi so there's a large window in hillary's office and <laughs> While Hillary's talking, Luke just appears from the side of the window and has this look of disdain on his face. Thanks, babe. He won't actually listen to this podcast, so he won't know we're talking yeah. about him. But, well, he was not happy with that text message. Anyway, back to the topic. Okay. So, many options. Yes. Many, many options for it. breastfeeding. Is so not you don't have to enough. go. You don't have to go like, okay, breastfeeding's not working. I need to do formula. Because yeah. I think that's no. probably a very common Yes. misconception for sure. Now you do need to identify what your true goals are and make sure that you protect your milk supply. So for example, let me give you an example. This was a real patient. So she is a couple days postpartum. Her baby is very small, came early, is needing to feed every two to three, maybe can go one, four hour stretch in 24 hours, but really every two to three hours. She really wants to breastfeed, but she thinks somebody has told her just breastfeed throughout the day and then you can give a bottle of formula overnight. So in her mind, she's thinking, I'm combo feeding, I'm breastfeeding and I'm formula feeding, which sounds like a good thing. But the major piece of information that was missing there is that if you're not removing some milk when you're giving a bottle of formula, you're not even going to have enough at the point that she was in. So like in these first two weeks postpartum in that first month postpartum where she was needing to number one, establish build milk supply, just breastfeeding during the day and giving a bottle of formula at night. Mm. She's not even going to have enough milk. She's like telling her body, this is she, all I need. Exactly. And she's not even going to get to the point where she can do full direct breastfeedings during the day. Yeah. So she might've she needed put, to Pump, pump a while bit. she's yeah. giving formula. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There, there could have been another plan there. So I got to her too late. So unfortunately, and by too late, I mean, it was the building phase after. was over. Right. And so she was still able to give some breast milk, but she, the people that were helping her did not clarify that with her. She thought she was going to be able to breastfeed during the day and then just give bottles of formula overnight, but she wasn't even able, she would have made a completely different decision if she'd been given all the information. Mm -hmm. So that's where I say, going back to, you have got to work with a lactation consultant so that you can, and ask clarifying questions. Like if you don't understand something or if you want something really bad and you know, like that mom really wanted to sleep overnight. Okay. Maybe what we do is we plan on getting your milk supply to be 75% of what your baby needs. And we can plan on doing some planned formula bottles, but there's strategic, there's strategy behind it. Mm -hmm. So just removing milk during a 12 hour day and sleeping 12 hours at night, you're not even going to be able to meet the goals to, for doing a couple direct breast yeah. So there's just a lot of nuance to it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Cause I wouldn't have even, I would not have even thought about that. So basically they need to go and they need to channel their inner questioning for sure like question ask all clarify. the questions ask, ask it in three different ways yes so that you make sure that you get all the information. yes so that you can make an informed decision okay so that you can make it and you can feel confident and you also don't look back and feel not that this mom felt guilty but she all she regret she, she was she was she angry know. yeah she was angry that she hadn't been given the information that would have made her, she information was withheld from her. Yeah. The people that were supporting her saw that she was tired and they made the judgment that it was more important for, for her, her to get sleep, to get sleep than for her to 
meet her feeding goals ultimately. Yeah. And that's not their place. No, it's not their place. Like she may have made that same decision, but it needs to be her decision. It doesn't need to be a decision that was made for her because she information was withheld or not presented in a way that she could understand. Yeah. So when should we consider like when you're having trouble and you try all these things and you're working with a lactation consultant, at what point do I say to you, I, should I just throw in the towel? Like when, I've been what, asked, at what point do you get to as a lactation consultant where you say, yes, you should probably consider throwing in, in the towel or do you ever get there? Gosh, that is a, it's hard because I would never want to throw in the towel before my patient is ready to throw in the towel. Mm-hmm. And by, I don't even like that term, throw in the towel, pivot to something else is okay. what I feel better with. I recently have had a few patients that it was more of me educating them on this is where we're at. I don't see things changing. You're past from, this right. phase yeah. of yeah, breast milk supply, whatever. If it we're is. talking about low supply or milk never coming in. So let's say your milk never comes in. So your baby's not transferring anything at the breast when you do weighted feeds and you're pumping and you're not pumping more than 10 or 15 milliliters, which is like half an ounce. Okay. Mm-hmm. For reference, a two week old baby is probably taking somewhere between two to four ounces at a feed. So you're pumping and you're barely getting half an ounce. After the first month of life, if we haven't seen an increase or we really haven't seen any, yeah, if we haven't seen an increase in breast milk production, that is what I'm going to have conversations about. Maybe we just nurse for comfort. Maybe we transition to looking more at efficient, effective feeds. I personally, Baby Seller is all about helping parents understand how feeding affects sleep feeding affects sleep and how sleep affects feeding. So we want you to have a baby that is able to take efficient, effective quality feeds, whether that's at the breast or whether that's with bottle feeding, because we know that well-fed babies sleep better and sleep is so important for parents, for moms, for babies. It's just so important. That is undebated. There is tons and tons of Incredible, good evidence-based research that sleep is important for our physical, mental, developmental health and well-being. Okay, that's not. I not can attest to this after having your not youngest children at my house. Actually, your two-year-old likes to get up at five a.m. Yeah, when he and is even on losing a couple of hours. <laughs> yeah, which is eight 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 a.m. <laughs> made me time. very tired. Yes, so, so I can only imagine anecdotally. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Well, so also I was Clay's dad when you came and saw me when he was like six weeks old. Right. Yes. Yeah. True. When I was there. So, so yeah, that was so like you've, you've at least four good night. nights of, yes, you know, sleepless nights. <laughs> but yeah, so I think that there's always that part of it too, is what are we, do- are we making sure that the feeding care plan is allowing for you to get good quality uninterrupted sleep? Is your baby able to get some pockets of quality sleep and things like that? So it's because that's developmentally very important for the baby too. Yeah, Yeah. I would argue so. Yeah, for sure. I mean, realistic expectations, your one month old is not going to sleep 10 hours at night, Mm -hmm. but definitely it's something that we can set your baby up to naturally start to extend their night nighttime sleep when we're optimizing daytime feeds. Okay. And we're going to talk a lot more about yes, that in a different conversation. Sure. Um, okay, let's switch gears. And we've talked about a lot of the challenges and how we overcome challenges. Let's rewind and pretend like we're pre-delivery and we are preparing to have whatever success breastfeeding that means to you, whatever successful breastfeeding journey that means to you. How can me as a type A um, wanting to be very prepared early mom or pre mom, how do I prepare best to have that successful breastfeeding journey? Okay. Am I allowed to give a plug for my book? Yeah. Go for it. Baby's made simple. Yeah. Order it right now. Okay. It's on Amazon. That is step number one. Step number one, read that book before you deliver. Yes. hundred percent before you even do a prenatal consult, which is my next tip, because You're going to, there are going to be seeds that are going to be planted. And I've had patients that I have seen postpartum that have said, that have come to me and I've said to them, 
I'm so impressed with your knowledge and how you navigated this early on. It's because I read your book. So I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I just have pointed out some things that are very common challenges and giving you some information on how to navigate those in the book. But besides the book, prenatal consult for sure with a lactation consultant in your area, you can do one virtually, but you just want to have that person that you can ask your specific questions to and have someone that you're already really developing a relationship with so that they are your go-to person postpartum because your pediatrician, your OBGYN, they are not going to be your go-to and they people. don't have the bandwidth and they're not no. the experts. And they're not, no, they are not going to be who's going to help you with breastfeeding and feeding. They're going to tell you that you need to right, that you need do to, better or you're doing a great job. You need to triple feed or which is when you breastfeed first and then you pump and then you supplement your baby with a bottle afterwards. That is super exhausting. I never recommend triple feeding past the first two weeks postpartum, but your pediatrician is going to see you and your baby. And they're, if they're not gaining weight, they're going to tell you that you either need to triple feed or you need to supplement with formula, but hopefully they're going to also make the recommendation that you need to find and work with a lactation consultant. Breastfeeding class, highly recommend. If you can find one in your area, you can take one online. I do think it's beneficial to go be in person somewhere if you can, but doesn't have to be, it could be an online breastfeeding class. And then I would say seeing a a lactation consultant early and often. So when when you deliver, when you deliver deliver. the prenatal, but then also when you deliver, get in there and yes, for sure. The lactation consultant that you see in the hospital does not count. That is not who I'm talking about right now. You will probably see a lactation consultant in the hospital to help you initially with latching, but a lot of times labor nurses, mother baby nurses are great at that. It is that three to five days when your milk comes in, identifying if there are any problems, early intervention is key. So Mm -hmm. seeing a lactation consultant after you leave the hospital is really, really imperative. I would say even if you think that everything is going well, there's no problems. There's still things you don't know. Like yeah, the, the stages of breast milk supply, yeah, but keep even going back to that because who knew that that was a thing? Yeah. But even if you're a seasoned mom, just doing a check-in to make like, even if this is not your first baby, just meeting with a lactation consultant who can check the latch, you can do a weighted feed. I'm sure you have some random questions that you want to ask. Just having that person that is an expert on this topic to help you navigate and troubleshoot is just so invaluable. Truly. Okay. All right. Great. Um, going into the support system, we talked a little bit about mental health, um, a little bit earlier, how critical is it to have support on your feeding journey? And, you know, especially in breastfeeding, cause I think it's a physical thing, but maybe you're deciding whether you're going to breastfeed or bottle feed or combo feed or whatever you're going to do. How critical is a support system for you? It's really critical. You, I always tell moms in my prenatal consults that before you deliver, trying to come up with a postpartum plan that allows you to just focus on feeding your baby and feeding yourself in those first six weeks, you are going to feel so much better at your six week postpartum visit than someone who delivered, gave themselves a couple days break, and then tried to get back to doing everything Mm -hmm. that they used to do. And that's, what's so hard for women like us who are used to doing a lot of things, managing a lot of things, having a lot of tasks. We've got things in our mind that we want checked off. We're it's hard to stop. Yeah. Yeah. But you really, I didn't really learn that until really my fourth baby. Like I can't say that I truly followed that after clay was born. I literally did not plan or cook a meal for 12 weeks. Mm. And that some people may be rolling their eyes and be like, well, that's great, but that's not me. I'm not saying that that's everyone's plan, but my husband knew that that was a huge stressor for me. And so he, that's one of the things that he just, he knew it was a stressor for me and he took it over. And then we just kind of did it as long as I needed him to do it. Mm-hmm. So everyone has their own thing cleaning. Like I need a house that's clean. I can't sit down and rest if my house is dirty. And so we wrote into the budget housekeeper twice a month, things like that so that I can spend time focusing on feeding yourself and the baby. Yeah. And, and breast, whether you're breastfeeding or pumping, or even if you're 
bottle feeding formula, feeding babies eat somewhere between eight to 10 times in 24 hours in those first six to 12 weeks postpartum. Well, that is a lot of time spent feeding. And I would say most feeds take at least 30 minutes up to an hour. So you're spending, it's an entire work day. Yeah. It's a plus. work day. Yeah, yeah. A work day plus, plus you're not getting long stretches of sleep overnight. So you really, there's not a lot of room for other things. Um, you know, getting yourself a shower, taking care of your hygiene needs and putting the fork to your mouth Mm -hmm. like that. If you can, so if you had a wish list item, the support would be figure out what are the pain points before yes, and discuss that with your partner and basically see how much you can limit from a responsibility standpoint yes. after yes. you deliver. Try to not have any other responsibility except for taking care of yourself and your baby. And even if you have multiple kids, like I had three other kids with my fourth baby. So obviously I couldn't just hang out in my bed all day with my newborn, but you figure out what, what things do you have to do? What things can you delegate? There's definitely things on your list that you can delete. Mm-hmm. You have to, prepare ahead of time to deprioritize things. And you just have to know it's like, for a limited time. It, this is a short season and it does not feel short when you're in it because you're sleep deprived. Right. But you want to be able to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. You don't want to feel like you're not, you're, you're not performing like you should, or you're not hitting that. You just want to try to get rid of all non-essential tasks Mm-hmm. And just really focus on, on feeding and your newborn during those first six weeks. All right. So for the partners that have a early mom who is having challenges or maybe is just starting on this journey, what would you tell, like, if you just had them in a room, like maybe one of your patients partners, Yeah. what would you tell that person? Like, what advice would you give the support person? to be assertive for them Mm -hmm. and make sure that you're handling them with what is it saying? Kid gloves. Yeah. Yeah. Just handle with care, handle with care, lots of grace. Yeah. Sleep deprivation makes people say and do things they wouldn't (laughs) normally do. (laughs) What's tell me something that you said or did while you were sleep deprived. One thing I remember, our poor dog, like this last postpartum period, Amos, he was a German wire hair pointer. I was actually talking to one of my patients about this the other day because they were telling me that their dog was panting like crazy and they wanted to, you know, they felt so bad because they wanted to like kill him because they've got this <laughs> newborn and they just gotten the baby to sleep and their dog's over there going, <sighs> you know, just like excuse me, panting. And I was like, I can relate to that. When Clay was a baby, Amos, our elderly dog, whenever it would storm and Amos would, is no longer with he's us, no longer with us. Um, but he had a great life. He was 14 RIP, years old. Amos. Yes. But he would literally just pant all night long. And I remember getting up in the middle of the night and I literally g- dragged him into our bathroom and locked him in there because I just couldn't <laughs> deal with it. We just, you just don't have, you just don't have the patience yeah. for things like that. And I think, you know, was it his panting or his disgusting farts? Probably both. <laughs> but I, I know in my relationship with my husband, I feel like we always treat the ones we love the most, the worst <laughs> when we are at our yeah. at low points. Like we, I, I definitely have been, we'd have to have Luke come on and tell us what his advice would be to partners. But I would say Luke has always just been a listening ear and supportive Mm -hmm. and yeah, just patience and grace. Okay. That's good. All right. So as we're kind of winding down this conversation, I've got a couple of questions for you. So should I be scared of these questions? Well, no, not yet. I don't think so. Um, what are some of the must have as a potentially breastfeeding mom or preparing breastfeeding mom? What are the products that you must have in your house before you deliver that will help you with breastfeeding? Not necessarily name, name brand, brands. I do but have just some like favorite name brands. I would say some kind of nipple butter. 
Okay. Because mm, that yeah. sounds interesting. Yeah. Because that was a thing. It is going to be, if you know, even if you've had a baby before, you sounds like that's how you make a baby. <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't know. I'm not an expert <laughs> on that. Or maybe I am. Only well, you have four kids. Yeah. I think you're... But you're going to need it. Just trust me on that. Okay. So raw coconut oil is just go to Whole Foods and that's get the nipple container. butter? Yeah. That's okay. like the... I mean, you can buy branded nipple butter. I mean, okay. every breastfeeding product company out there sells it, but raw coconut oil is my favorite. Okay. And it's a natural antimicrobial. So that is what I would recommend. Okay. Um... Some kind of breastfeeding support pillow. The My Breast Friend is my favorite one, and it has been for the last five years. There are some other brands that are coming out, but you want to make sure that you have some kind of supportive pillow that gets baby at breast height. And then you do need a breast pump. Even if your plan is to exclusively breastfeed and never, never pump or bottle feed or anything like that, you still need a breast pump because and you don't know what challenges right. may happen. Be prepared. Don't be like Hillary without the bassinet. Right. Exactly. That yeah. was from our birth. That was from our birth stories. Um, I have heard that most insurance companies, if you have health insurance, yes. most insurance companies will provide you or buy you a, a breast yes. pump. Yes. Yes, they will. They will. That's most great. of them will. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so I have a funny story while we're talking about um, postpartum. Uh, breastfeeding okay. products. So you're going to remember this as soon as I start talking about okay. it, but I just think this is a great story. So Hillary and Luke came to Arizona. When, when was clay was maybe Ooh. six months old. Um, that was in March of last year. So March, he was like, yeah, eight, eight months. Yeah. Old. So eight months old. So he was still, you were still like yeah, still in nursing. the breastfeeding journey. Yeah. Um, we were having a great time. We went out to a great brunch one morning, uh, Francine, if you have been to Scottsdale, um, love it's it. French, favorite. French bistro. It's really awesome. They've got a great brunch, very fancy. Um, so while we're at this fancy brunch with a uh, eight month old, we decided, we decided to start brainstorming products that we're going to, um, oh my start, we're going to like produce and basically make, you know, millions of dollars off of, um, cause that's just a fun game that we like to play. So one of the products that Hillary brought up was glow in the dark nipple shields. Yes. Which I have never, I didn't even know nipple shields. I didn't know nipple butter you know, was a thing yeah. until today. But at that point, my husband and I were like, nipple, what <laughs> nipple shields. And Hillary's like, this is what they do. So tell us what nipple shields do. Yeah. So nipple shields, I will say this. If you're using a nipple shield as a lactation consultant, it's always going to be my goal to get your baby and you off the nipple shield because babies do not transfer as much at the breast when you're using a nipple shield. So just imagine drink, drinking through a clamp straw. That's what it's like. And if we are trying to get efficient, effective feeds so that we can get more sleep and have a baby that sleeps through the night, the nipple shield can be one of those things that is a roadblock. So, so it pulls your nipple out it, and it all, it does. Like if you have flat or inverted nipples, it can help pull your nipple out so your baby can latch onto it. But it can also a baby that has a high palate or a baby that has a tongue tie. There's other reasons why you might temporarily use a nipple shield so they, and some people use them and use them their whole time. They breastfeed. You already feel like you need five hands to breastfeed. When you add a nipple shield, it's, it's just, it can make things complicated. I worry about milk supply because again, drinking through a clamp straw means low transfer volume. And so it's always going to be my goal to get you off the nipple shield. But if you have to use it early on, it's, it's fine. Okay. Well, we're going to have a new product that is the glow in the dark nipple shield. Do you remember what Nate? So my husband, who's never like, yeah, has not been exposed to breastfeeding. We're just coming up with these products. Hillary throws out there nipple shield glow in the dark or lights up so that you can see it during nighttime feedings. Yes. Do you remember what I do? I do remember what he said. I want you to <laughs> tell her. So funny. That. So he, four seconds after Hillary says glow in the dark nipple shields, he says it should be called light to tup. <laughs> <laughs> oh like who comes up with that? I don't even know. So, you know, I think there actually is a glow in the dark nipple there? shield on the market now. Okay. I feel like there is, or maybe well, like, I think it's by series chill. I think they have a, 
skin like if it's on your skin it's a different color i don't know i feel like i've seen something well we have not gotten one nobody has lights it up no but now somebody might take that name well we're trademarking it right now we're putting it on the record that that is our name for our glow in the dark nipple shield so (laughs) come into a target near you (laughs) christmas 2024 wow yeah glow in the dark nipple shield lights it up on everybody's christmas list Oh my so, gosh. Anyways, okay. Well, I thought that was a funny story. That is funny. Um the other question that I had, our last question, is really if you're not doing breastfeeding and you decide you want to do bottle feeds or you're gonna combo feed, you're gonna have yeah. bottles, what are the bottle accoutrement that you need in your house? Yes. So obviously formula. Mm-hmm. You need to do some research on formula. Mm-hmm. I will link a formula guide in the show notes here. The thing about formula is that they're not all the same. Mm -hmm. All formula is not created equal. They're think about your, you know, mass produced chicken versus your, you know, cage organic, organic, cage free, lived on the range chicken. Like I'm not saying they're exactly equated like that, but what's important to you might not be important to me and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So you definitely want to have at least a little bit of knowledge to know what you should be looking for in formula. But the first thing you need, is, need to do is identify what's important to you. So I have a, a free formula guide that you can get here in the show notes. Um, I will say that the ready to feed formula that you get from your hospital or from your pediatrician's office, it's probably not going to be the best quality formula. It's just probably not. So should you, would you recommend, even if you're not planning to formula, feed, like give formula, mm-hmm. you should probably at least flirt with that topic a little bit before you have the baby. Would you recommend that? And just, I would like at least know in your mind, this is the type, if I have to go down that road, this is the type of formula that I would want to use and maybe have something For on sure. hand. I mean, I personally always had a can of formula in my kitchen cabinet before I brought a newborn home. Yeah. I'm sure there are lactation consultants that would uh, disagree with me on that, but I don't want to be stressed and having to give some formula that I don't believe is a good quality formula because it's the only thing that yeah, I Yeah, and if you're choosing that over your breast milk yeah. and you're in a place where you need to make that choice, you're going to want to have... Well, yeah, the truth it. is, is that there are medical indications for supplementing with formula mm-hmm. or donor breast milk, but donor breast milk is not easily accessible mm-hmm. to people outside of the hospital. So, you know, it's just not. Mm-hmm. So if you have one of those medically indicated reasons to supplement your baby, I personally want to supplement with a formula that I have researched and chosen, not the formula that is it's, the one that I can get my hands yeah. on because I need it right now. Yeah. So Bottles, I definitely, I personally, for the last more than a decade, so Boyd is, he'll be 13 in November, have been a Dr. Brown's fan. Those are the bottles that I recommend for 90% of the babies that I work with. They're just a great, great bottle and they really promote efficient feeds, bottle feeds. Mm -hmm. Um, So that would, that would be what I recommend. But those two things, formula and bottles. And probably just have them just in case. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it. Is there anything else you wanted to lay on us today of your knowledge? No. Did we get, are we going to deliver an hour to, we're going to have at least an hour long. I think that we're at about an hour and 10 minutes for sure. So Courtney, you're welcome. (laughs) Uh, Hopefully you enjoy this long episode and I guess we'll just wrap this up and let these moms get back to early momming. Yeah. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Thanks for listening to the Early Momming Podcast. Before you go, can I ask you a favor? If you enjoyed listening to this podcast and you're excited about what we'll be talking about in the future, please text your best friend this episode and tell her to give us a listen. And if you have time, do you mind going to leave us a review? Let us know what you liked. We are here to serve you. Plus, your reviews will make our podcast more findable for other moms to be able to join in on these candid conversations. Shout out to our sound guy, Kyle Moore, who makes it way easier to listen to us. And if you need to get in touch with us, send us an email at podcast at babysettler.com or send us a DM at early momming podcast on Instagram. All right, we'll see you next time.